Friends, we continue our journey in the book of Acts this morning. The passage that we've heard read from the opening verses of Acts 21 will be our text, and I encourage you as always to follow along so that you may verify that the things that I am saying are congruent with what you find there. But first, let us do the work of coming to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we continue to give attention to your word, we do not want this to be an exercise in futility. And yet, if your spirit does not accompany me and those listening, there is very little we will glean and gain. But Lord, we trust that as we attend to this means of grace, your spirit will abide, that the words that go forth will be helped by the Holy Spirit, and that he will apply them to each of our hearts, that we may bring glory to your Son, our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. As is the case in many of these latter chapters in Acts, it's, it's a bit of a geography lesson as Dr. Luke details all of the apostles' movements from place to place. In particular, we're at the stage where Paul is making his way to Jerusalem, and Luke is careful to note some of the various groups of people that Paul meets with along the way. Accordingly, this is not a passage where you're going to find a lot of exhortations. Uh, you're not going to see imperatives laid out for you in clear ways for us to obey and to implement in our life. Instead, what we observe as we give attention to this text is a set of hard circumstances that await the Apostle Paul. And so we want to take careful note of Paul's posture and the example that he sets for us in the face of these hard circumstances. In other words, Paul is presenting us with a model for how to follow Jesus Christ and how to follow him in the midst of adversity and suffering. Because many of us, I think, would admit we're, we're great at following Christ when the waters of life are calm. But when there are disruptions, challenges, suffering and pain, we struggle. And so we look to Paul for an example of how to carry ourselves. Now, as I consider some of the challenging seasons in my own life, as I think about the times of greatest pain for me, and I compare my response in those hard circumstances, and I compare myself to Paul, I see that there are some obvious deficiencies and how I have approached suffering in the past. Similarly, as I think of those whom I have pastored over the last three decades, I've concluded quite clearly that I'm not alone, that most followers of Jesus urgently need Paul's example for how to carry himself as a Christian in times of great pain. And since all of us, every person in this room, will suffer at some point, it would be very important for each of us to be equipped with a perspective and a posture that is congruent with what we find in Scripture. Let me just be honest and begin by noting an unbiblical approach to suffering that I am well acquainted with, an unbiblical approach to suffering. You see, my usual approach to suffering, to my shame, is marked by secrecy and isolation. And in some ways, my response to suffering and pain has become more pronounced as a pastor than at times before. You see, I have believed the lie that says that a leader must always portray strength 
I've believed the lie that says a pastor must always have his life together. And so during times of intense suffering, I haven't always been honest with others about how I'm doing and how I'm feeling. And perhaps inevitably, this secrecy leads to isolation. It really wasn't that long ago following the death of my mother in 2017 and the death of my sister in 2019 that my wife, Allie, had to gently confront me about my isolating ways. You see, in those days when I was struggling, I'd come home from church, and after dinner, I would put myself in my study, and I would shut the door. And I wouldn't engage my wife. I wouldn't engage my daughter. I would just shut myself in, as it were, hide, isolate, and deal with my pain in isolation. And so, as embarrassing as it is to share this unhealthy and unbiblical response with you, the reason I share it with you is because I think there are some among us who do exactly the same thing. And before I call any of you out, I need you to know this is something that I struggle with as well. I think many of us will agree when we're hurting, it's easier to be alone than with other people. It's difficult to be with happy people if we're feeling sad or depressed or despondent. It's difficult to be with people who look like they have it all together if we fear that everything in our life is coming apart at the seams. We worry that we might get emotional. We'll come to a service like this and something will strike us and we're worried about being overly emotional and what other people will think about us. So we stay home. We isolate. I've observed so many Christians over the years who will steer clear of gatherings like this because they are suffering. And they don't want anyone to see what they're going through. I've even heard people confess to me, Pastor, I'll be back as soon as everything's sorted out. I'll be back when the waters are calm again. But this is not what we see in Scripture. The biblical witness contradicts any practice of isolation. Friends, it is when we are at our lowest, when our pain and suffering is most acute, it is then we need to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ the most. J.I. Packer once described the church as a hospital where no one is completely well and any of us can relapse at any time. Friends, this is not a gathering of perfect people. It's not even a gathering of healthy, happy people. It's a gathering of God's people. And some are hurting. Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor Bryn, you haven't really got into the text yet. I want to set up what's going on, what Paul's feeling He's facing great pain and suffering, and he's interacting with people along the way. And so I actually want to take us back to chapter 20 and look at those final verses one more time. Acts 20, verse 36 and following. And when Paul said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So Paul is experiencing some pain. And the elders that have come from Ephesus are hurting at the notion that they'll never see their friend again. And this pain gives rise to three elements 
First, you'll see there's prayer. Second, you'll see there are outward expressions of sorrow. And thirdly, you'll see there is physical affection. So first, you see their prayer was earnest. They didn't simply bow their heads. They knelt on the ground. And they prayed with one another earnestly. Secondly, there were outward expressions of sorrow. And Luke provides very helpful detail here. It's not that there's overly one emotional person who is crying. You know, sometimes we go to family gatherings and we like to pick on that one person who's quick to cry at a tender moment at the gathering. This is not one overly emotional person, but Luke says there is much weeping on the part of all. Everyone is weeping. Outward expressions of emotion. And so we must reject the unbiblical idea that expressions of emotion and sorrow are to be kept private. I realize that's how you may have been taught as a young person, but it's not the example of Scripture. And it's not the case that a few people in the gathering shed a tear or two, or that their voices cracked a little bit with emotion as they said goodbye to one another. No, there was much weeping on the part of everyone. I don't want us to forget or or move past the physical affection. There's physical affection taking place between Paul and the elders who've come from Ephesus. And I want us to keep in mind that this gathering at the end of Acts 20 is predominantly men. It's predominantly men who consoled one another in their sorrow by embracing one another. Again, I I understand that many of us didn't grow up this way. We don't know this kind of physical affection, particularly uh, between men and men. it, It hurts my heart to think back to my own childhood and to tell you I don't have a single memory of hugging my own father. I don't have a single memory of hugging my older brother. But then I see this example. How Christians are to bear one another's burdens by gathering for prayer, expressing ourselves emotionally with one another, and with physical affection. And this pattern continues in Acts 21. It's not just the elders from Ephesus. It's the ministry team as they land in Tyre we're told that they sought out the disciples in verse 4 of chapter 21. And even though Paul is hastening to be in Jerusalem, he remains entire for seven days. This is very interesting to me, because as we've been tracking with Paul, he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. He's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. But when he gets to Tyre, he says, let's go find the disciples here. And he spends seven days enjoying the fellowship with the disciples in the region. And then after a week in Tyre, Paul and his team spend a day with Christian brothers in in Ptolemaeus. Now it's not seven days, it's just a day, but he pauses again. From there, Paul heads to Caesarea, where he and his team stay with Philip the Evangelist. By the way, just a little rabbit trail with Philip the Evangelist. Why is he called the Evangelist? Because we see him evangelize in Acts chapter 8. But I also think he's called Philip the Evangelist so that we don't confuse him with Philip the Apostle. Philip the Apostle, who is one of the twelve. And then we're told later on about his four daughters, and we think, whoa, where did, where did these daughters come from? We didn't hear about those in Acts 6 or Acts 8. But remember, the book of Acts spans 30 years or more. 
And so about 20 years have passed since we've last heard from Philip. And since then, he's moved to Caesarea as a wife and some daughters who prophesy. We're told in verse 10 that Paul and the ministry team stay with Philip for many days. So I take many days to mean more than seven. He told us about seven in Tyre, told us about one in Ptolemaeus, and now, now it's just been so many days he doesn't give us a number. He just says they're there a while. Why do I share this? Why does Luke share this is more important? So that we don't miss how hungry the Apostle Paul was for Christian fellowship. Friends, does this describe you? Or are you in a hurry to be somewhere else? Paul was in a hurry to go to Jerusalem, but he's not so hurried to get to Jerusalem that he gives up opportunities along the way to have meaningful fellowship with other Christians. And what's obvious in these gatherings is the profound level of of mutual affection between Paul and his hosts. Notice also how serious the conversation is between them. In Tyre, for example, Paul's friends speak to him through the Holy Spirit, and they urge him to not go to Jerusalem because of the dangers there. Similarly, in Caesarea, the prophet Agabus acts out a prophecy. Taking Paul's belt, he binds his hands and his feet. Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When those who are present there with Paul hear this prophecy, they urge him, don't go up to Jerusalem. Now, if you're following this closely, you may have had the same level of pause as I did. And that is, at first glance, it appears that the Holy Spirit is giving a conflicting message. At first glance, it seems that the Holy Spirit wants two different things. But let's backtrack for a moment to Acts 20, verse 22 where Paul says he is constrained by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. And then in Acts 21, verse 4, however, the disciples are said to be speaking through the Holy Spirit and they're urging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And then in Acts 21, verse 11, Agabus warns Paul, speaking on behalf of the Holy Spirit, of what's going to happen to Paul when he gets to Jerusalem. How do we reconcile these discrepancies? We understand the nature of God, don't we? We understand that the Holy Spirit is not contradicting himself, nor is the Holy Spirit changing his mind. If we take this section of Scripture as a whole, it would seem prudent to view the Holy Spirit's message as predictive and not prohibitive. Predictive and not prohibitive. In every city, the Holy Spirit is warning Paul about what will happen in Jerusalem. He repeats the same warnings to, to the Christians in Tyre and in Caesarea. In every context, Paul's friends tell him not to go to Jerusalem. So again, how are we to understand this? The Holy Spirit says this is what will happen. And his friends say, don't go. I think the best way to untangle this is to see the similarities between Paul and his friends and Jesus' interaction with the apostle Peter. 
referenced in Matthew 16. You'll remember the passage. It's by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Holy Spirit tells Peter this. And, and Jesus says, yes, you're right. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter. The Spirit has told you this. And now I'm telling you that I must suffer and die in Jerusalem. Do you remember what Peter says? Forbid it, Lord. This will never happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Whoa, what just happened to that conversation? Paul, Peter's speaking to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, saying, you are the Christ. Jesus says, I'm going to suffer and die in Jerusalem. Peter says, no way. So beyond this common feature of both Jesus and Paul traveling to Jerusalem to suffer, there is also a parallel distinction between the supernatural revelation that's given and the natural promptings that follow and emerge from the human heart. In other words, we need to make a distinction in Matthew 16 and in Acts 21 and say that the warning of suffering was divine, but the urgings not to go were human. The warnings about suffering in Jerusalem were divine in nature, but the urgings to not go are human. The Holy Spirit's predicting what's going to happen, and the people's love for Paul caused them to not want him to go. Once we understand the distinction between the infallible promptings of the Holy Spirit and the fallible urges of human beings, then we can understand and make sense of this. Now, Paul loves his friends. He loves these fellow believers with whom he enjoys fellowship. And so you see, he takes their urgings to heart. Look at verse 13. He's not dismissive. He says to them, what are you doing? Weeping. You're breaking my heart. Paul's not dismissive of his friend's counsel. But as compelling as their urging may be, the Lord has spoken through the Holy Spirit clearly and repeatedly. And so Paul must go. He says in verse 13, I am not only ready to be imprisoned, but I'm ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're back to the original thing we started with. How do we account for Paul's readiness to suffer? He's our example. He's our model of how a follower of Jesus should bear up in the face of hardship. And we ask the question, how did he do it? What made him ready? What made him say the things he said? I think there are two things. One, Paul has a clear understanding of the Lord's will. Paul has a clear understanding of the Lord's will. Let me say this as plainly as I can. We do not court suffering, do we? Suffering's not fun. We don't like it at all. But it seems that suffering produces something. And it produces something that's good. And so we trust that when God speaks about the suffering that awaits Paul, that there's a plan. And that Paul is trusting God who has spoken clearly. He's trusting God to advance his purposes by the means of Paul's suffering. So Paul, like Jesus before him, says, I'm willing to suffer because I understand this is going to go well in terms of God's plan. That's the first reason that Paul faces suffering so well. He has a clear understanding of what the Lord has said and what his will is. But the second thing ties in with everything we've said in the last few weeks. Paul is strengthened 
through spirit-filled fellowship that he enjoys with other believers. In other words, the reason Paul is so brave in the face of suffering and death is because his friends embolden him and encourage him. You see, I have no doubt that Paul's many stops on his way to Jerusalem were not simply for the benefit of those he was visiting. It was for him. He needed the encouragement of this fellowship. Being certain of the afflictions ahead of him, Paul longs for the love and the encouragement he receives from being with other spirit-filled believers. It blesses, it blesses him, it heartens him, it enriches him. The call of God must be obeyed. And so off to Jerusalem he goes. We're going to tackle Paul's time in Jerusalem in future Sundays, but I need to tell you a, a, what I think is a helpful story that is told by author Oswald Sanders, who is the director of China Inland Mission years ago. Oswald Sanders tells the story of a young man who was beginning his work for the Coast Guard. And the young man was called to be in a crew that had been called to a particular rescue mission during a very serious storm. So it was the young man's first ever rescue mission, and the conditions were treacherous. And as the young man's lifeboat prepared to launch, it appeared quite clearly to everyone that the boat would be overmatched by the ferocity of the wind and the waves. And so as the lifeboat heads out, the young man shouts to his captain, We'll never get back! We'll never get back! And the captain replies over the sound of the storm, We might not ever get back but we still have to go. We might never get back, but we still have to go. You see, the Apostle Paul had an acute sense that he would never get back, but he understood that he had to go. And so as I think of what might lie ahead for some of us, I pray that the Lord would give us the same brave resolve when it comes to sharing our faith in Christ. Now, thankfully, very few of us will ever have to suffer for the gospel the way Paul suffered. And yet, every single Christian is being called to go in some manner. We're called to go and proclaim Christ. That may be in your household, your neighborhood, your workplace. It might be in some far-off place. But in some manner, we all must go because we have a message to share about who Jesus is and what he has achieved through his death and resurrection. We must go and share his love with others. And if we've learned anything from this passage, it is this. As we go, as we go and proclaim Christ, a huge part of what will sustain us in our going is the encouragement we receive from spirit-filled fellowship with other believers. Some of you have heard this analogy before in terms of what do we make of what we're doing here? What is this? Are, 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 we, are we on a football field where we have positions of people doing various things? Those sirens always get me, don't they? What we are doing now, I liken to a football huddle. Have you ever watched a, an American football huddle? It's not very exciting. 
It's just, just a bunch of guys leaning over and one person telling the others what they're going to do. And then they pump one another up. They, they slap each other in the back sometimes. And they get each other worked up. But the huddle doesn't ac accomplish anything except it emboldens them to go do the play on the field. And so this isn't the thing. This is the huddle. And as we leave this place, as we break from this huddle, we go to do the thing, which is to proclaim Christ. Some may say, I, I don't go to church because it's just a huddle. It's just a huddle of Christians talking about what they ought to do next. We need each other. If we're going to share Christ effectively, if we're going to share Christ in the face of opposition, we're going to need the encouragement that we receive from one another. I need the encouragement. I, I, I know I've shared enough personal things with you this morning. Why don't I share once more? I often tell my wife, I really feel it when you're not in worship, when you're teaching Sunday school or you're traveling, because her presence emboldens me. It encourages me. And on another level, you all encourage me. I notice when you're missing, we feel the absence of the people, and we feel emboldened when we're together and no one is missing. Because spirit-filled fellowship is part of what fuels the mission. Spirit-filled fellowship is part of what motivates us to share the gospel. So I encourage you to lean into this kind of fellowship. Let's lean into spirit-filled fellowship for the sake of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Amen.